He was prepared for his message. And he's asking, is that some type of symbolic meaning of being prepared and how we be prepared for our message? Is that what you mean? Um, this new knowledge and just applying it in my life today. Because what I'm saying is that, like, prior to coming here, you know what I'm saying, um, I was once a Negro, you know what I'm saying, and lived in that fashion, and, like, now coming here in the right knowledge and, and taking in this new way of life, it's not like something that's like presto change or I'm just changed person overnight. Right, right. So I'm just saying, it's just like it's a trial process, a process that I notice that I have to go through as far as, like, living it and applying it in my life and it's just right. not it's not necessarily easy right yeah but and I'm, I'm just saying you know what I'm saying yes exactly it, 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 and you're supposed to take it gradual just like just like every firm thing in nature that grow it grows man has been taught that he was created like boom but actually man grows in the wound of his mother and he grows into this state so you grow gradually into perfection. No one, and no one is expecting anyone to make a transition overnight and all of a sudden drop all their bad habits and stuff. No, that, that's not. That's, that wouldn't be human nature. That would be something that we have to fear. If someone just came in and told me, "Bam! I just changed. I stopped drinking. I stopped smoking. I stopped this," I have to worry about that person. Something ain't right there because it, it just ain't normal. Human beings grow into things, and this is a growing stage. But it's not just because of us. It's the nature in itself. Everything is changing. And that's why it's time for people and the way they look at things to change. Because now we have entered into what's referred to as the information age. And in the information age, things that cannot be scrutinized, analyzed, verified, justified, and all the other five got to go. And one of those things that got to go is what they call old time religion. Old time religion, whether it's Mohammedism, Christianity, Judaism, if it's not being brought up to date where it makes sense, because now we can take the Bible, the Quran, the Torah, and put it in computers and analyze it word for word, verse for verse, chapter by chapter. And if you don't know Hebrew, you can go to a Hebrew concordance. If you don't know Greek, you can go to a Greek concordance and you can actually analyze the words. And you come to find out when you do that, most of the things that you was taught was all lies. Then you have to wonder what the purpose was. But you wasn't forgotten. That's the main thing. You wasn't neglected. Because where there is no truth, truth will come. We'll never be left in a state of, and I don't like to say darkness, because the most perfect state you could be in is darkness. The reason why I say that is because before they cut on the light, there was darkness. Before God said, let there be light, there was darkness. So if God is the one who said, let there be light, then God must have been standing in the darkness when he cut on the light. And anybody that makes you think darkness is ignorance and darkness is dumb and darkness is backwards is ignorant, dumb, and backwards. Because God was in darkness. You follow? And they set this system up to tell you, boy, it's a dark day. That person has a black heart. And that goes back to what the implication was in that Muhammad story. That they actually had to wash a black dot off Muhammad's heart is what they say. But in there, there's a subliminal teaching that them Arabs are teaching that black is bad. Because if Muhammad had a black spot on his heart that was evil and they washed it off, these two guys who came in white suits or white robes, then the implication again is that evil is black. You hear me? And then the Muslims say, well, the black stone, the Hajratul Aswad, they call it, was once white. And all the people circled it had sin in them, so they kissed this black stone, the white stone, by the, I mean, and it became black as their sins dumped into it. So I was one of those people going, hey. <laughs> A whole bunch of other Americans I met, Muslims, converting, they're going, oh, alhamdulillah, all praises to God. They think that sounds good. But I was the one going, hey, you telling me the stone was white and it was pure and people kissed it and their sins went into it and it became black. What are you saying about me? And if you're not saying that about me, let's explain this thing. Because I looked at the black stone from less than three inches. And it wasn't black, it's brown. And that made me even matter. <laughs> I understood the implications that were going to be trans 
planted into the child's mind that was going to make children think backwards and think bad of themselves, see themselves as evil. I understood that they say white angels come with white robes on and white wings and white doves. I understood what was taking place. I wasn't going to get into the racial battle because I know they would lose. Because if I go back to anthropology, sociology, and any other theologies, I come out there. I come out far in the front. But I understood the biggest game was to teach it through religion. Because religion tells us to have faith. And by telling us to have faith and telling us to believe, it isolates a very important element, investigation. Because if I'm told to believe what the reverend says, then I can't check him. If I'm told to believe what that imam or that rabbi says, then I can't stand and say, well... I disagree with you. I don't see what you see. I don't understand your concept of Trinity. Well, you know, Trinity is uh, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. So I say, yeah, that's, that's what's bothering me. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Make that clear. Three persons in one. The Holy Ghost is a person? Well, um, now let's get back there. The Father is a person. Three persons in one. The Father a person? How about the Son? Is the Lord Jesus Christ a person? And anybody who don't believe that he came in the flesh is an antichrist, correct? So that Jesus was a person. That's one of the persons. Now let's go back to Jesus' Father, whom I say many times, Jesus said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Not our Father, who art here on earth. So now, is our Father, who art in heaven, a person? And what does the word person and personify mean? Personify means to come down into a physical form, a cardinal existence, personage. Now let's go back and say three persons in one again and see. If it makes sense. The Trinity is three persons in one. Is it true now? Is the Holy Ghost a person? Is the Holy Spirit a person? The Spirit that descended in Pentecost as a fire on the disciples? Was that a person? No. So somebody told me a lie. And if I catch that one lie, now you are no longer reliable. <laughs> And I got to check your source. And as I check the source and I go to the Bible, which is the word, and I start walking through it step by step, I start seeing a whole different picture. I start seeing a man called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who said, I am my own accord can do nothing. I am not greater than he who sent me. That's what he says. Then I see him say my father who is in heaven. Then I hear men saying, Jesus is his father. And I say, well, I know the Christ I know went into the garden and fell on his face and he prayed and said, oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Now, that person was praying to God. Now, well, if he went in the garden and fell on his face and said, Oh, myself, who can make it possible, I shall make this cup pass by me. That would be the first person singular. But this person went into a garden in fear and fell on his face and he sweated blood and prayed and said, Oh, my father, if it be possible, let it pass by me. Not of my will. But what? But that thou will be done. So he also separated his will from God's will. And said, not my will, God. I, I, ain't, I ain't messing with you. I know you the man, God. I'm merely the son. But somewhere along the line, someone pulled what they call a gypsy switch on us. Someone did a three-card molly on us. They switched the card so fast, they got us walking around saying Jesus is his father. And don't realize we are blaspheming. When he said, I am the way, the truth, the life, what? No one cometh unto the 
Father, but by me. I can take you to the Father. I am not the Father. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. It's not my house. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me. And if I went through the Lord's prayer right now, you know what you'd see? You'd see how clear it is. And then it should make you understand that there must be some type of spell. Now, if you open your Bible and started reading the Lord's Prayer, and Jesus said, pray ye after this manner. And he starts by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy, thy, on earth as it is in, give us this day our who is the provider? Where is he at? According to Jesus. So who switched this thing around on us? Who took us off the path that led to the heavenly father? Jesus was an Israelite. An Israelite didn't have no son in between them and the father. Jesus was a Hebrew. You won't find nowhere in the Tanakh or the Torah any interventation in between. And then when it got past Jesus, it got even worse. Now we got the Pope. Now we go kiss his ring, who kisses Jesus' ring, who sits on the right-hand side of God. We're getting further away from the Father as we listen to men who want to be God like Nimrod. This is the day and time we're in. It's time for us to confront these things. And it may sound, man, our grandmothers, they say, man, grandma's going to turn her grave. She hear you talking about Jesus, boy. I say, well, I'll just turn her right back over and rest her assured everything is all right. Because we're going to have to deal with this stuff today because the condition of the minds of our children and the conditions of the minds of their children is that they're going out killing each other. And they're seeking out drugs that immobilize them cripple them right the kids are starving for something and the church or the mosque or the synagogue couldn't provide it you know why because the reverend disassociated himself with the kids they need to pick up that organ and throw it out and put Snoop Dogg in the church and the church would be full of kids if we're trying to get the message to them we might, we might not like the way that sounds, but that's what they're listening to because when we come home from church and you go and they go up in their room, they don't put on any organ music. And the sign was in families like the whinings who came out singing in the name of Jesus and then start singing the name of who they love. They was trying to tell you. Everybody keeps saying it. Well, you know, Aretha Franklin was a good Christian, but now she's a... You know, James Brown used to be a good gospel singer, but now he's a... What is it telling you? It's telling you that God is trying to tell you how to spread his message. Reach out to kids. You want to get to the kids, you got to come to them their way. I don't mean you got to come to them and bow to them. I mean you got to come to them their way to get their attention. And the church does not provide it because these are factual children. Because they can take what we say right to the computer and analyze it. And if the reverend gets up there and says the wrong thing, they'll look up the word reverence. They'll look up the word pastor. Imam. They can look it up in Arabic in the dictionary. Imam, an Islamic minister. <laughs> Is a minister a minister? You hear me? When you analyze what has happened, you got to go back to the root of the problem. The root of the problem is the misinterpretation of the presence of God. That's where it's happening, whether you call it Allah, Yahweh, His way, or their way. It's the misinterpretation of the divine inside each individual here. We talked about that last night. The divine is seated in you. I breathe into you, he said, of my spirit my breath of life and you became a what a living soul that's what the bible said
God says, I placed a portion of myself inside you. Somewhere along the line, somebody who wants to get in between you and that power says, but you got to come and hear it from me. I'm, your, I'm, I'm the one that's due reverence. He said, no, all reverence is due to God. They said, well, his son is due reverence. Say, no, his son is due respect. All reverence is due to God. They said, well, we worship Christ. It says, it says, worship God in spirit and in truth in the Bible, not in body and in untruth. He said, what's in the Bible? Where'd they lose it? You know when they lost it? When we got the misconception of God, and then when you get a misconception of God, you automatically get a misconception of the devil. We start looking for the devil, the way these movies depict them, as some little red man with pitchforks that runs around and is going to get us on Judgment Day and burn us. And we didn't know that our best friend was the devil. We didn't know our next door neighbor was the devil. Because we got the devil already drawn up in a little red costume with a pitchfork. And my next door neighbor was the devil. But he's selling drugs to children. You follow what I'm saying? I got a boy in my neighborhood named Vincent. If that wasn't a devil, that boy would go in jail and come out of jail and go in jail and come out and be out on the street a week before he even pull another stick up or hit somebody upside the head or snatch somebody's pocketbook and they say, guess what, what? Vincent is back in jail. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> say, Vincent is back. Say, he's back. He just got out Thursday. Yeah, he went to a party and raped some girl and hit somebody in the head. He's back in jail. And I was all the time saying, now I'm saying, now that is the devil. The Bible don't say there's one antichrist. It says anybody that does not testify that Christ has come in the flesh, they are of the Antichrist, a whole bunch of them according to them. And you don't know who you're walking with. You don't know who you then married. You don't know who you're kissing. You don't know who's luring you and seducing you because of the concept of the devil. See, the two most important things, concept of God is messed up and the concept of the devil is messed up. You're looking for God and God is in you. And you're looking for the devil, and the devil is the one trying to attempt the God in you. And it could be your lover. He could be in a happily married, and here come the prettiest nigga in the world, just to distract your emotions while you're walking down the street with your wife or your husband. Pants so tight, you can't resist the look, unless there's something wrong with your jeans. And that happens too. Makes you peek. Makes you cheat. And they put that deceit, that little speck or that black dot like that brother say, back on your heart as they call it, the black dot. Hear me? We've got to reverse this because whatever thing they have been teaching us and have been guiding us by, let's look at the world. It does not work. But if we go back to ancient Egypt, you know what we'll find out? We'll find out that they give you the impression, the same, the same preachers and teachers, that the Egyptians were rock worshippers. Or you see those two dogs there? That they worship those dogs. That's an idol. Catholics got nerves saying that with all them idols they got in their churches. You hear me? They want to make you think that God saw the Egyptians as some type of pagans. But they can't do it while reading the Bible to you. They have to quote the Bible, put it down, and then start talking. Because if you say, stay in the word of God, just read to me from the Bible, they can't trick you. They'll make a fool of themselves. If you start asking them simple questions like, did God trust the Egyptians? Do you know? Does anybody know? Did God trust the Egyptians? The answer is quite simple. Who do you trust with your only kid? 
Would you send your only kid to someone to take care of them from the time they were born until they're 12 years old if you didn't trust them? Your only kid. <laughs> your unique kid. Your only begotten son. Would you take that son and give them to a group of people from 0 to 12 years old because you don't trust them? No, you wouldn't. Would you send your elite your personal angel to go to your son and take him into a place where they worship hawks and dogs and stuff like that, what they think we do? Would you? No. Then why did God send an angel to Joseph by night and tell Joseph to get up and take Mary and his son and sojourn in Egypt until Herod dies <laughs> because Herod was a mischief maker and Herod sought to kill the son of God why did God trust the Egyptians with his son from birth till 12 years old if the Egyptians were so bad and you can read this story in your Bible can't you God said, Moses, you are in Midian, amongst the Midianites. Jethro, his name was. Ruel, his real name. Get up and go into Egypt and tell them to what? Let my people go. We like that story because when he gets there, it looks like Moses met opposition from the Egyptians, we go, see, them Egyptians is bad. But we forget that God said years ago, get up out of the land of Canaan, which I give to you, and go into the land of Egypt and stay there. You'll be safe. There's no famine there. Excuse me. Maybe I'm wrong, but I thought God controls famine. I think God knows where it's going to rain, where there's going to be earthquakes, where there's going to be storms, where there's going to be hurricanes. I mean, you know, I know God knows these things because God is all knowing. So God knew that the land that was promised to Abraham, Jacob, and Isaac as a land of Canaan flowing with milk and honey was going to cease to have that milk and honey. God knew that. So God came and said, get up, right, and go into the land of Egypt and sojourn there until the famine is over. That's the second time God sent his beloved or chosen people to these pagans, these idol worshipers. God trusts them when you don't. He didn't stop there. God sent Abraham to Egypt. Now let's check the nature of Abraham, the patriarch of monotheism, versus the people he confronted there. On the way into Egypt, Abraham feared that the Pharaoh was going to take his wife Sarah because she was so beautiful. Correct? You with me on that? Am I making this up? All right, because people, you know, they, they like to think you're making things up. They, don't, they haven't heard before because they haven't read the word. I mean, they, but so Abraham, with all his wealth and his flock, went to go into Gerar, a Kuba land, crossing into the Sinai, into Egypt. And he was confronted by the Pharaoh's men. <laughs> and Abraham came up with a plan. He came up with a plan all by himself. God didn't visit Abraham and tell him to do this one. Though Abraham walked and talked with God, this one, Abraham came with what? Right by reading right in your book of Genesis. He said, I'm going to tell them that Sarah is not my wife. She's my sister. So that they don't take her. Now, I love Abraham as much as you do. But I want to know why he lost trust in God. Why all of a sudden, 
He didn't think that God would protect him and Sarah and Lot and the rest of his people to the point where Abraham lied. You may not call it a lie because it's Abraham, <laughs> but when you strip away the name Abraham and the goody-goody stuff, you come down to someone lying. He told the Pharaoh that that was his when she was indeed his. And then the Pharaoh said, well, that makes her available according to my law. I don't know about the Torah. I'm an Egyptian. I worship dogs and those things. And our law, the Pharaoh takes what he wants there. And Pharaoh and Sarah was fine. I mean, she had to be fine if Abraham said, Tag, when I get to Egypt, the Egyptians are going to want her. <laughs> and the Egyptians were fine, so Sarah had to be fine. <laughs> and Abraham said, I got to protect this. This is mine. So I'm going to lie. So in this case, lying is okay? Or is Abraham wrong for lying? In the law of right and wrong, without compromise and bull, in the law of right and wrong, in the thou shalt not section, you know, in the department called commandments and things, was Abraham right or wrong for lying? He was wrong for lying. But the Pharaoh finds out later that it was what? His wife. And he apologized and said, then why didn't you just tell me it was your wife? I never would have touched her. I respect the God of Israel, he says, right in the Torah. Is that in there? So now, the Egyptian Pharaoh says to Abraham, I respect the God of Israel. Take your wife. You think that happened once? No. Isaac repeated the exact same incident and lied again to the Pharaoh. Right? Which character of people appeared to be closer to the word of God? These Israelites coming over there with their lies? Or the Egyptians who when they found out he lied, gave him his wife, feared his God. He said, I fear your God. My fingers is falling off. I, no doubt about it. Your God got juice. You follow? But he included him as his God. First of all, it's established that Abraham and the Pharaoh were talking to each other. So they were speaking what? The same language. Abraham was a Chaldean. He spoke Chaldean. The Egyptians are Mizraim from the word Mizraim in the Torah. And Mizraim is the son of Cush. So the Egyptians are descendants of Noah, just like Abraham. They predated Abraham when they migrated. So Abraham was talking to ancient Hebrews who had picked up Sumerian customs and traditions because they had none of their own because the Torah had not been revealed yet. So they had no law. And that's why the Bible keeps saying the law came from Moses. Who was first, Abraham or Moses? So what law were they living by before Moses came? The Babylonian law, the Sumerian laws, and who are they? The Chaldeans. And this is why Abraham was able to go into Egypt and conversate with a pharaoh without a translator. Because the pharaoh was also a Chaldean. You understand? But the point is, God knew that and Abraham didn't. <laughs> God trusted the Egyptians and Abraham didn't. And Isaac didn't. And the Egyptians showed themselves to be true and honest and returned his wife and gave him wealth. You follow? Jacob was deceived by his own 12 sons because they wanted to kill Joseph because they were jealous. Right? Is that true? And they set out to literally kill the man. 
out of jealousy, their own blood brother. But one son, Judah, stepped in. And Judah said, let's not kill him, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. Right? So, they took Joseph and they put him in a well. And the Ish Ishmaelites took him into Egypt. And he became a pharaoh in Egypt, though, and I repeat, though this is not recorded anywhere in Egypt, there's no record of this ever happening. You hear me? It's a strictly Israelite doctrine, strictly Bible. It did not happen, okay? But let's make like it did. Joseph becomes a pharaoh in Egypt. His brothers come because Jacob is dying and they lie to their father. Here they go lying again. Right? Jacob just wants to see his son again. To make the long story short, they end up in Egypt and that's how the Israelites start sojourning again in Egypt. And the Egyptians say, well listen, you have your own population and your own beliefs. We're not going to chop you up and kill you. We're not going to call you a cult and persecute you. We're going to give you your own land called Goshen. And y'all could build there right outside of Egypt and do your thing. You could even work and be employed in here. And the Israelites were blessed by the Egyptians. But just like, just like some of us Negroes, when it came time to be grateful to the Israelites for their help, <laughs> the Egyptians didn't want to help them. They got so big and powerful in Goshen that they set up a second Egypt, their own empire, and set out to war against the Egyptians. This is recorded now, but they don't call them Israelites. They call them the Phoenician invasion against Ramesses but they show them with the Star of David. What are the Phoenicians? Phoenicians, Chaldeans, ancient Hebrews, same people. That's recorded. Are you with me? What am I getting to? Deception again. And I started getting flashbacks of Egypt and Israel and how we came out here and we're in the Bible Belt and they're like the Israelites. You follow? and we're setting up Egypt. We have the same God, but they want us to interpret God through their ideas and their concepts and their beliefs, and I'm saying it didn't work. Your system in Christianity is not working for you. Right? How many people here know Christians that are drug addicts? How many here know Christians that are gangsters? All you gotta do is watch one hip hop video. They, I killed the world, burn down the motherfucking bridge. Got a big old crucifix, this big. You see him, right? Big old crucifix with the Lord hanging on it, going to kill the motherfucker, kill the burn children, doesn't that problem get it? And I said to myself, something wrong with that belief. I don't think anything is wrong with the Word of God. I think something is wrong with the way people are starting to interpret the Word of God because they're getting away from the Word of God and getting into the Word of rest. Because God controls everything. And the Egyptians had food when the Israelites had none. The Israelites had protection for the Lord Jesus Christ when the Israelites couldn't do it. So he had to tell him, take my son to Egypt. So how can a person drive by here, call himself a Christian, and see Egypt in the making and say, something wrong with those folks? I think they worship that man, Dr. York. They don't know the difference between worshipful master and worshiping the master. 
of a couple of women who been went on to the lodge and got gotten enrolled and walked the path. Maybe they find out what the word worshipful master means, but they didn't. So now we're in a day and time where people don't even recognize the presence of the kingdom of God. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Jerusalem is not the kingdom. Jerusalem, as the book of Revelation said, right now blood is running the streets of Jerusalem. People are killing each other. Arabs claiming it's theirs. And Sephardim and Ashkenazim, which are Russians, and people who came from England and France calling themselves Israelites over there are claiming it's theirs. Israel is our land. We're that lost seed of the house of Israel. When Jesus said, I come to my own, and my own receiveth me not, he was talking about us. Because the people that did receive him, you know who they were? Paul, Romans. People that did not belong in the seed of Israel. We did not accept it. We never accept our own. I get people calling me all the time on the phone. Guess what, Pops? Remember you told us there's life on Mars? And I said, yeah. It's looking, go, here's the email. Go to this number. And some Caucasian says, well, we discovered water on Mars, which means where there's water, there's life. They say, Pop, you were right. I said, I said to myself, why well, got to be right now? Why well, couldn't I be right when I told you? I didn't tell you I was a prophet or I was prophesied, and I told you I'm not no prophet. And I'm not going to let you make me no prophet to turn me into somebody that goes, I tell you, I'm not the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't try to pin that crap on me so you can use that as an excuse. But messages are sent to you. Voices are passed through to you to give you the word. It's only when the person passing the message tries to get in front of the message, he gets in front of himself, starts ego tripping, and becomes Yahweh ben Yahweh and starts calling himself God. And then I got to turn around and say, yeah, you God. You a goddamn fool. And I think we got more of them circulating than God's. You hear me? We're in that day and time where change is necessary. They can't control the weather. Tornadoes. I've, I'm, I'm 53 years old this year. I've never seen so many tornadoes in one year in my whole life. Have you? We had hail in Georgia here like golf balls just two months ago. Is something wrong? Tidal waves, landslides, people giving birth to litters. I'm talking about seven, eight kids. That ain't in this here book. What's going on? Animals born with two heads. Right? War. Rumors of war. Pestilence. We got invaded by locusts in Georgia this year. A biblical thing. Is that something? And you asking for the signs of the time? You want to know when the end is coming because in this Bible, and this is, and this is the King James Version, I'm doing it so you don't get all shaky now. And now y'all live. It ain't my Bible. You right, it ain't your Bible. King James wasn't no Christian. King James was a crazy faggot. I like this chapter of Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be toned down. What is he talking about? 
He's talking about the great temple of Solomon. Correct? According to this Bible, if you do any research, has this day and time come yet? No. You know what you got to see? The wailing wall fall. There's still a wall standing in Jerusalem with Jews standing around about a thousand, rocking and praying. This prophecy can't be fulfilled until that wall comes down. See, they got you thinking that this is the day and time for the prophecy to be fulfilled for Jesus to return. And it might be if them dumbass Arabs hurry up and blow that wall up. But as long as you see that wall there, then a portion of the temple of Solomon is still standing. And this Bible, the book of Matthew 24, says what? There shall not be thrown down maybe one stone. That means it all must be flattened out. Why? And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, speaking to Jesus, when shall these things be? When shall that happen, Jesus? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? And when are you going to come? How are we, what signs are going to mark your coming? And of the end of the world. And what is going to be the mark of the end of the world? Three things. What's the sign of your coming? What's the sign of the end of the world? When will, and when will this temple fall down? It says, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. You got that? Now why did I emphasize man deceive you? Huh? It doesn't say the devil. It doesn't say Holy Spirit or unholy spirit. It doesn't say witchcraft or sorcery or sorcerers. It says watch out for men, your fellow human beings. But you read this all day. And when you hear watch out in the Bible, your first thing is watch out for the devil. <laughs> this is telling you watch out for men, human beings. Walking, talking, sitting before you eating. I'm talking about husbands, wives, best friends, associates. Those are the ones that pull you off the path because they're the ones nearest to your heart. They know how to work you. They can make you angry at God, angry at the world by how they manipulate your emotions. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And they say, see, there are going to be a whole bunch of people parading around here calling themselves Christ. That's not what it says. It does not say that many people are going to come around saying that they are Christ. They're going to say, it says many people shall come around saying, I am Christ. They're going to they're gonna acknowledge Christ and be the deceivers. They are going to acknowledge him. Say that, oh, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. But Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. But did we heal in your name? He's going to say, I never knew you. Get away from me, you workers of iniquity. Because while they're pretending to be good Christians and God-fearing people, they're nothing but men acting a part of devils. And that could be any of us. Because we can flicker off the path. I ain't stand there playing holy than thou. I can flicker down this air, get a heartache. My feeling can get drunk and go out and bat, bat somebody to death today. It can happen. If you think you got it together, that's when you got a problem. If you think you can't fall off the path, then you really off the path. You hear me? Six. And you shall hear of wars. And rumors of wars. See, see that you be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But, Jesus said, but the end is not yet. Now we're living in the wars. Back in the 60s, we were hearing about these wars. 
and the rumors of the wars. And we were fighting Arabs and we were fighting in China again. Pakistan and India is at it. No longer rumor. They tested in, they're testing nuclear weapons. Like I said last week, nuclear weapons are in the hands of Muslims and Hindus, not Christians. And they are testing them right now. And the United Nations said, don't do it, and they did it any darn way. They got the power to destroy the world. They're not Christians. They're Hindu. They worship monkeys and, and all kind of crap. I've been, I was there. And the Muslims, I was one. So I know how crazy they are. Because I sat amongst them, they real sick. And they'll, they'll push the button in the name of Allah. You see what it does here? So I sat amongst Muslims. I was one. They are crazy. They believe what they're doing is right in the bottom of their heart. Saddam Hussein will let his whole country starve to death in the name of the law. That's the kind of mind you're dealing with. And then Pakistanians are Muslims and they got nuclear weapons. And what, and what the American government needs to do is they need to study the mentality of Muslims to know how dangerous they really are. They don't do that. They're looking at too many Arabian night movies and um, Jafar and what's the other one? And Yasmin and what's that movie? Aladdin movies. And that's not what they're dealing with. They're dealing with a group of assassins that are unbelievable. And it ain't over. But these people got nuclear weapons. This is in the book here. This is what the fear is. These are the signs of the times. We're no longer living in the rumors of wars. We are having the wars. People got weapons now, one country that can destroy the world. You think people are turning to God for help? No, you know why? Because nobody believes in God no more. They didn't lost faith in God. Because God isn't able to deliver. Because when your child dies, you look up and say, why me, God? I can think of a million other people who, whose children should be dead. Why mine? Or when your brother gets killed in a car accident, you say, why? Then people come along and say, where and when is the help coming from God? I need to hear it. I need it now. We need that miracle now. So the churches have to rev up. Jesus is near. Jesus is near. I'm going, how near? How near? We're 2,000 years away now. Come on. Near, 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 near. How near? How near, Rev? Come on. I need him now. I need some Jesus right now. Things are bad. I can't wait with y'all no more. I got to go seeking God. Now, I can't be sitting around waiting for God to come for me. So when I go to seek God, I got to start questioning you. When I open your Bible and I flicker through it, I say, let me, I got a chapter here. Here's one, Exodus 33, 11. And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his friend. That's the Bible. It says, and the Lord, Yahweh, that's Yahweh in there, spoke to Moses, Moshe, Feini, Ia Feini in Hebrew. Face to face. Feyim is a physical face like this one. A surface of something, right there in the Hebrew Bible. Now, I look at that and go, well, did that mean that Moses saw God's face? The Bible says it does. Now, if the preachers of the world, let me tell you what they mean. It doesn't mean that. What it means is I know what it means because uh, I spoke to Christ last night. Huh? And he told me, he spoke to my heart and told me to tell y'all, huh? but face don't mean face. <laughs> Say, come on, Rev, cut the, guy, cut the crap, man. The Hebrew, you're talking to someone who reads Hebrew. I speak Hebrew. It, the, word, the Hebrew word there, feim, is, or they say peim in the Yiddish, feim is face like this face. It says Moses talked talk to God like this. I guess if you met God, that's, that's how you would talk to him too. You better not talk to him any other way. What's so funny is 
if I go to the 20th verse of the same chapter, it says, And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. I'm in Exodus chapter 33, verse 11 and verse 20. Write it down in your mind. Because within the same verse, one place it says, Moses talked to God face to face. And the next verse it says, Thou canst not ra'u. Ra'u is Hebrew for see like I see you. Now again, Rev might say, No, Doc, brother, 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 this is a spiritual sight. See, God was in spirit and his presence was there. Said so in Hebrew, brother, not in Greek in the New Testament, in Hebrew in the Old Testament, the word there, feni, physical face, the word there, waru, to see as I see you. What are aid? I see you. This verse says, you can see me. And this verse says, you cannot see me. Somebody lying in the same verse. But two people wrote the same book. He couldn't remember 11 verses with all these books in there. And that makes me wonder. Let me see. I, I think I got another section here somewhere. Sectioned off. For this here. This is, this is, I find this stuff real interesting. You know, you know something else is funny? Look at this. I got one to read for you. I put it aside. And there was yet a battle in Goth where was a man of great stature that he had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes. Twenty and four. This man this man in the land of God had six fingers and six toes. Oh, I'm not seeing, I know, I know like you, I've seen people with extra fingers. Oh yeah, but which one of us is in the image of God? The one with the six fingers or the one with the five fingers? That's where the problem comes in. I'm not saying he didn't have it because the Bible said it was there. But the point is, if God's hand is in the Bible and God has five fingers, I assume God has five fingers because if I ask y'all to put your hand up right now, your right hand, you count them fingers, how many you come up with? If I tell you to count them cruddy toes of y'all, and don't you women bend over too far, you might see six toes if you ain't taking care of yourself. Right? But if that is, but if the average person looked down and leaned back like this and count them toes, you come up with how many toes per foot? You come out with 20, not 24. And if the Bible says God created man in his image and after his likeness, did he? Now, where did six fingers and six toes come from? You need that. That's in Samuel's. That's in the 21st chapter, the 20th verse. Write it down. Go home and look at it. Again, in, what's this? First Chronicles. We're going to repeat the same thing. Watch this. 20th chapter 6 verse and yet again there was a war in God where was a man of great stature whose fingers and toes were 24 and 20 six on each hand and six on each foot and he also was the son of a raphim they say which is the word they use for giant raphim he's a giant he has six toes, six fingers, and he's in the Bible. You hear me? Where did he come from? If everybody on the planet Earth that's in our image and after our likeness is in the image and after the likeness of God, where did this person come from? Just like when Cain is being thrown out the garden, and Cain is afraid, he tells God, he fears that whomever finds him will kill him. Now, 
He just killed his brother Abel. There was nobody else on the planet but his mother and father. Who was going to kill him? Wasn't nobody else. And then he went on to the land of Nod and found a wife. <laughs> and married someone that had children. And nobody was on the planet. Who did he marry? Eve? No, because Eve and Adam got back together again and had sex. So they was in another place. Where did they come from? Who are these people? And why aren't they teaching you about them? Why aren't they teaching you about Genesis chapter 6? Where it says, and I'll read it so you don't think I made it up. This is my grandmother's Bible. It's marked up like you wouldn't believe. I wouldn't part from it. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on earth, on the face of the earth, sorry, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, whole, agreeable, not fair like in looks, and took them wives of all which they chose. The sons of man, the Hebrew word there is Adam. Adam's children multiplied on earth. And it says right there in verse 2, this is Genesis chapter 6, verse 2, that the sons of God, Bayum, Obeynum, Elohim, plural, the sons of the Elohim gods, saw the daughters of men, saw the daughters of Adam, that they were told good people, fair, as they put it. And they took them. And, now check this. And they took them. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not always strive with men, for he is also flesh. Yet all the days of his life shall be 120. Who is this? Who is the spirit of God who became flesh that lived to be 120? Because you say Jesus went to the cross at 33. Who is this? During this same period of time, Joshua didn't live to be 120. Moses did. During this same period of time. It goes on though. It says, there were giants. Again, hear that? The word comes up again. There were giants in the earth in those days. No kidding. Now we know where our six fingers and our six toes come from. Now we know why they called them giants. Because the word says, other than Adam's family, there were giants in the earth in those days. But if you try to present this to a preacher and say there was people on the planet before Adam and Eve, they will call you crazy. Archaeologists, paleontologists, research has proven that man is older than 6,000 years and that the pyramids predate the Bible. And when you look at the drawings and the, uh, and the carvings of ancient Egypt, they draw people as giants. They draw them 20 feet tall. The doorways and the archways into the temple are 30 and 40 feet tall. For the passage of what? Giants. And these giants ruled in the earth. And these giants took the daughters of men and had children in the earth, the Bible says. You know what that says? That they are chromosome compatible. Because if they were some extraterrestrial with green arms and bones out their head, they genetically would not be able to breed with a human being. The fact that these giants were here first and human beings were able to breed with them. These are called the sons of God in your Bible. The ancient Egyptians were the giants in the earth called the sons of God. And they married the daughters of men. He said, well, where are these giants now? Playing basketball. You just got so used to looking at these people seven, eight feet tall. They're bringing people in there from Africa. I mean, 
Now on the other end of that, there's pygmies. I see people in Africa this big. Full grown human beings with a conversation and everything. No bottle, no, no diaper. I'm saying that to say, they ain't telling us the whole story. They ain't telling us the truth. Those sons of gods who come and says in their nephil, nephilim, which comes from the Hebrew word nephala, to descend downward. They came down here to earth. What did Jesus say? I am from, you know what word is there? Look it up in the dictionary. It says anu, right in the Greek. I am from anu, above. You are from beneath. Guess what Jesus said? I am from heaven, and you are from hell. I came to pull you out of hell. Pull you out to, of the filth and muck and mire. But he said also, I came to my own, and they received me not. And you want to know why we're in this condition? Because we did not receive the truth when it came. We didn't want the grace. We laid, apart, we laid aside the law and started listening to men like Paul, a liar. Paul came to erase all the ancient laws. That's all he did. He told you right in 2 Corinthians, I was a worse, worse hater of Christ. Right? He admits it. He said, I was the worst of liars. And he is the father of what's being called Christianity today. Paul, a man who never met Christ. So yes, he did, uh, uh, Doc. He did. He said he was walking along the road, and, J and Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why? He wrote that crap. That's the same Farrakhan is doing. Farrakhan, Elijah Muhammad said, I was walking in Chicago, and a guy walked up to me and said, Elijah Muhammad, yeah. He's from Sandsville, Georgia, so he goes, yeah. He don't go, yes. Well, yeah. He said, I'm God. Elijah Muhammad said, okay. And boom, the nation of Islam walks around believing that a man came up in Detroit in the year 1930, walked up to Elijah Muhammad, said he was God, and that's what Farrakhan believes. And the man is white, you know. I got pictures of him. And they believe, they talking about black, black powers. They doing all this black stuff, and their God is white. And you don't think we're in a bad state? Yahweh ben Yahweh said, I am. Yahweh ben Yahweh. Jehovah, son of Jehovah. He became the God and the son at the same time. Nobody better not put their hands on me because my father has a flying saucer that only I can see. <laughs> it's a little personal flying saucer, but it's right there. See? You can't see it, though. Just keep looking. And if they dare touch me, my father's going to rain down fire and brimstone. This is what he preached. <laughs> Three weeks later, that nigga was in handcuffs on his way to jail like this. <laughs> Without his Yahweh Ben Yahweh costume on, little t-shirt. <laughs> and been in jail ever since. That's what they're talking about. False Christ and false prophets and false teachers. Make people explain themselves. Put people on the spot, question, research, go to the library, don't stand here and like me, you know I'm the man that says don't believe me, check it out, every book I write I give you cross references, quotes, translations from the language, words so you can look it up, research it, because I know you're not going to believe me because it says you come to your own, your own. Who believes your family is the ones that don't believe you? I was standing with blonde hair, blue hair. Y'all be so having a white beard. I could just go, like, oh, y'all be that's Jesus. <laughs> I'm standing at middle aged, fat, almost. Man, you know, I ain't going to know what he's talking about. You understand? There's a day and time you better start listening and you better start questioning. And you ask everybody anything. If they can't stand it, tell them to get the hell out the kitchen. Reverend says, excuse me, I love what you're saying. Is this a sermon or is it a lecture? Or is it a class? Sermons, I'm not interested in. I get them at home from my parents. Lectures, I get at school. Right? If this is a class on the Bible, 
then I have the right to ask you some questions. And if you if you a little, I understand if you you know you're a little off center because of that. I understand that you ain't sure, but get your ass off the pulpit then and get somebody up there who is sure. Someone's gonna open that Bible and walk me through it word by word, verse by verse, chapter. That don't mean me. That means let's prepare the next generation. Now that we are conscious of the mistakes, because we didn't dare be conscious 25 years ago. Whatever we heard, we believed. Right? Now that we're starting to break this thing, let's breed children. And make, if you're going to be a Bible, study Hebrew and Greek. And travel off to Israel and read the Dead Sea Scrolls. Let the children come back with eyes open like I did mine. Coming back knowing the languages. Say we know pops. I said, I know what he know. Nothing that's in the King James Version Bible is in the real Bible. I said, I know. Now, how we get this to our people without being looked upon as some type of demon or some bad person because I'm fed up with the crap. Talk to me about some questions. I don't want to leave y'all up in there. Anything you want to talk to me about? Yes. Yes. He has them, and I, I just didn't fully get it because I had asked this question a while ago or last year. What I was explaining, where you find people with six fingers and six toes, is that what the way the Bible is written versus the way people explain in the Bible, the Bible is making it clear that there were people on the planet before Adam and Eve that were called gods and that there were giants. And that one race of them called Raphians had six fingers and six toes. They even give you Goliath, and they, a Philistine, which comes out of Egypt, and he was also the giant that David took down. And these genes were not the normal gene of someone who came out of the seed of Adam because it literally separates the seed of Adam from these giants. And say these giants are the sons of gods, not sons of God. The English Bible says son of God, but in Hebrew it says sons of gods. So there were gods walking the earth during the time that Adam and Eve was being created. And some of these gods were walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You follow that? So your son is a descendant of some of those gods from ancient Egypt. That's all. And that's why genetically he produced six fingers. It's biblical. It's not something we're making up. And, and, uh, and I don't care what the doctors tell you. It's right in there.